We have finished chapter 6, Jesus Christ the Savior. Remember, we had dealt in chapter 5 with man the sinner, and then chapter 6, a number of sections on Christ the Savior. Now we come to chapter or division 7, the Holy Spirit and evangelism. Shall we begin by invoking the Spirit's presence? O oh, heavenly dove, descend upon us, we pray thee, with special power. We know that when we were converted, it was thy work, and thou hast never left us. But at certain times, thou dost particularly visit us and make us especially conscious of thy presence. And so now, because we are teaching about thee, and especially thy great work in the conversion of human souls, the evangelization of the world, oh, help us, we pray, to understand thee and present thee as thou art, insofar as thou hast been pleased to reveal thy holy nature to us. We pray thee, Heavenly Father, that thou wilt send the Spirit into our heart according to thy will through the intermediation of thy Son, Jesus, and that he may take the things of Christ, make them real to us as he continues in our souls the work of evangelization which brought us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of thy dear Son. In the name of Christ, amen. Lecture 35, The Holy Spirit. One, in the economic trinity, the Holy Spirit is the third person in no way inferior to the first and second persons. The persons of the Godhead are equal in power and glory and the same in substance as we can see from the baptismal formula, Matthew 28, 19. Two, the Holy Spirit is the third person to perform his specific, agreed-upon function. First, the Father decrees redemption. Second, the Son purchases redemption. Third, the Spirit applies redemption. Three, the Arminian evangelical denies the sovereign decree of the Father, the sovereign redemption of the Son, and the sovereign regeneration of the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit is the evangelist of the Trinity. Evangelism is his special work in redemption. Five, he does not do the work of preaching, though he empowers and moves the Reformed preacher. Six, but he and he alone makes the preaching a demonstration of the word and power. 1 Corinthians 2, 4. Seven, when the evangelist crowds the Spirit and attempts to do or even share his work, the Spirit is grieved and may withdraw, Ephesians 4.30. Eight, it may seem strange that when Peter confessed Christ to be the Son of God, Jesus said that the Father, not the Spirit, had revealed that to him, Matthew 16.18. This was no doubt because the Father was the one who decreed that Peter should be illumined by the Spirit. Nine, the Holy Spirit not only makes the elect sinner over again, but he even continues to work in him to will and do according to his good pleasure, Philippians 2.12. <clears throat> Ten, so it is not I, Paul, who lives, but Christ by his Spirit who lives in me, Philippians 1.21. And it is not you, dear saint, who lives, but the Spirit who lives in you. That is the reason and the only reason you live. First, the economic trinity, the Holy Spirit, is the third person in no way inferior to the first and second. You understand by economic, we just mean this is an agreed upon distribution of jobs by the equal three members of the Trinity. The essential Trinity refers to their nature as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
same substance, equal in power and glory. But in eternity they agreed to create and redeem a lost world of sinners, and according to that agreement, the Father designated who those sinners would be, predestination. The Son agreed to redeem them by His atonement, and the Holy Spirit to bring them home by His, uh, the, the elect home by His regeneration. This was just an agreement that this person would do that, and the other person this, and the third one another thing. As I say, there was no legislation from the Father to the Son or the Son to the Spirit. They were equal. They agreed, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do the other thing. And what they did was decree salvation, secure salvation, and apply a salvation. The Father decrees it, the Son purchases it, the Spirit applies redemption. Now comes this sorry fact. I have to call your attention again. Three, the Arminian evangelical denies the sovereign decree of the Father, the sovereign redemption of the Son, and the sovereign regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Let me remind you once where we are in the history of the Christian religion and the state of the Christian church in the past and at the present time here. There are the three groups. The liberals would deny the doctrine of the Trinity out of hand. They don't believe there's a triune God. They don't believe there are three persons in the Godhead. They're Unitarians. And the joke around Boston where Unitarianism broke out and has been strongest is a Unitarian is a person who believes there's not more than one God. That's a kind of joke because most Unitarians today aren't even sure of the existence of God as such. But for a century and a half, they've been sure there are not three persons in the Godhead. So as far as this doctrine of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is concerned, they reject it all. That's the reason that I say there's no way in which they have any right to be called Christians. They ought not to call, and there have been honest ones among them who, admitting that's the truth, have actually given up the Christian name and gone out into some other field of thought or religion or no religion. But unfortunately, most of them insist on holding to that name Christian long after they've had any right to do it. But then the other group, as I say, are those who think man is well and all is natural. They're the liberals. But the other two groups who approximate the name, one of them consistently, the other inconsistently of the name of Christian, would think that man is sick and the other that he's dead. We've seen that difference with respect to man. Now, looking at this Arminian evangelical group who think man can restore himself to spiritual help by the assistance of God, but not without his help, we see what he thinks about the Trinity. He doesn't reject it. He believes it. He's a Trinitarian. He believes in the inspiration of the Bible. He believes in the deity of the second person of the Godhead. He believes in the atonement. He believes in justification by faith. He believes in the judgment seat of Christ. He believes in heaven and hell. He believes in the, most of the basic verities of the Christian religion, but when we focus on some of the details, such as the economic trinity and the work which he does, notice, he denies the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the work of redemption. He denies predestination, the decree of God that certain persons should be saved. He denies the specific work of redemption of Jesus Christ for the elect. Christ died for the elect. But these evangelicals will not accept that. They categorically deny it, vehemently attack it, and insist that Jesus Christ died for everybody. We've shown that's impossible, but that is certainly a part of their theology. And now we, they we realize that they deny the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit in regeneration. So they, 
They affirm the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're in agreement on that. They share with orthodoxy that particular doctrine, and they abhor liberalism because of its denial of it. But they deny the sovereignty of the Father. They deny the sovereignty of the Son. They deny the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. They deny the sovereignty of the Father in decreeing salvation for certain persons. They de deny the sovereignty of the Spirit in dying for certain persons. They deny the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit in regenerating certain persons before faith. They assume, of course, that the Spirit does regenerate, but after faith. So He is not sovereign in regenerating. He regenerates only because people believe, and He therefore rewards them, as it were, with a new birth, so that, strictly speaking, they deny the sovereignty altogether. Now, this is a sad picture. You hear, you see, here you're having to find fundamental fault with fundamentalists. You're finding fundamental fault with fellow believers. These are people who are in the same communion. You cherish them as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I believe these are people of faith. And yet I have to say in all honesty, these people of faith, these believers in the Word of God, these advocates of Trinitarianism deny the sovereignty of the Father, the sovereignty of the Son, the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. What do you make of that? It's a very, very serious thing. I'll tell you what I make of, and I'll let it rest at that particular point right now. What I make of it is that I still hope these people love the Lord they preach, but they ought not to be preachers. They don't understand the gospel well enough to be in the pulpit. There's a distinction between teachers and taught. Some are qualified to be teachers, and some are not qualified to be teachers, and people who don't understand the sovereignty of God in decrees and the sovereignty of the Son in His redemption and the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit in regeneration are not fit to occupy any Christian pulpit. Not to mention teach in theological seminaries and write books on theological instruction. And this is not only my vehement reaction to this particular theological aberration of the most serious and grievous where in a certain area, you know, it's worse than liberalism because you trust these people these aren't enemies of the faith. These are friends. These aren't anti-Christian. These are fellow Christians. These people do a Herculean effort in getting these Bibles to people all over the world and preaching Christ crucified. It makes you cry when you have to criticize them for this type of thing. But on the other hand, they're more dangerous than the liberals. You'll never trust the liberals because you know full well he's an enemy of the faith. You trust these people. You trust them when they believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and if you're overly simple-minded, you'll trust them when they're denying the sovereignty of the Father and denying the sovereignty of the Son and denying the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. But as I was saying a moment ago, it isn't only my deep distress with this and all the errors that go with it, but it's a statement of Jesus Christ in Romans 3.10. Ah, I mean Romans 3.10. In John 3.10, that makes it clear they ought not to be teachers. You remember Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus, the teacher of the Jews, are you a teacher or the teacher of Israel and don't understand these things? The implication was he ought not to have been a teacher. He may not have been a Christian at all. We don't know that. He didn't seem to understand regeneration. But one thing is there, very, very clear in the opinion of Jesus Christ. He was not fit to be a teacher because he didn't understand this. Remember what Christ was teaching him was a man had to be born again. And he went on, our Lord did, to explain that that new birth was from above. You didn't produce it. Nicodemus actually thought at first, are you suggesting I enter my mother's womb again and be born? Of course, Christ wasn't suggesting that but he was making it perfectly clear that this second birth was something that happened to you just as truly as the first birth was something that happened to you, and it happened by the Spirit who, like the wind, moves where he pleases. You see the effects of it, but you don't know where it comes or where it goes. The Spirit is sovereign, 
and Nicodemus is in a state of total perplexity. How can these things be when Jesus Christ says to him, are you a teacher of Israel and don't understand these things? I hope, my friends, some of you Arminian people are listening to this, and in the name of God, listen to it, will you? This isn't John Gerster talking now. This is Jesus Christ saying, are you daring to be a teacher when you don't understand that this regeneration comes down sovereignly by the Spirit of God from above? I believe you're a Christian. I think you love the Lord, but if you don't understand that, what are you doing as a teacher of Israel? I think all of you realize that these constitute the vast majority of the teachers of Israel. Most of the people in conservative seminaries today are holding this idea. Most of the books that are written are written by people of this persuasion. Most of the people who have the thousands of individuals listening to them around the world are people who are propagating that profound heresy. Who ought not to be in any pulpit anywhere at all, and yet they occupy most of the pulpits who ought not to be the teachers of Israel, and they probably constitute 90% of the teachers of evangelical Christians. I beg you, consider seriously. If you can't be persuaded of what Jesus Christ is saying there, at least demit the ministry. Stop the teaching until you do understand what he's saying and then do the teaching of his word. Number four, the Holy Spirit is the evangelist of the Trinity. Evangelism is his special work in redemption. He is the one who, when the message goes forth, brings it home. He is the one who works in connection with it to convict and persuade about Jesus Christ. And if anyone ever becomes a convert, anyone is ever born again in connection with your witness, with your prayers, with your preaching, it is the Spirit of God who has done that job. Five, he does not do the work of preaching, though he empowers and moves the Reformed preacher. He doesn't empower and move people to teach error. He certainly has never led anybody to preach that God is not sovereign in his decrees and the Son is not sovereign in his redemption and the Holy Spirit is not sovereign in his regeneration. There may be people in whose heart the Spirit resides who nevertheless are so poorly informed that they don't understand these things and I'm not saying people who say these awful errors don't have the Spirit of God in their heart, but I am saying the Spirit of God who takes the things of Christ and makes them clear to us has never taken the things of Christ and made them errors for us. He has never moved anybody to speak against the truth of Christ. Now, Christ may be in their heart, but he never moved them by his Spirit to teach such doctrines as that. Six, but he and he alone makes the preaching a demonstration of the word and power, 1 Corinthians 2, 4. Hey, all of us can preach. Even I can preach. I don't have any power. But people have said to me they were converted by it. It wasn't just preaching. To them, it was actually a demonstration of the spirit and power. Oh, I know full well they thank me but they know and I know I don't have that power. Nobody has that power. When someone is actually given a demonstration and it's brought home to that person that this is the Word of God, that's the work of the Spirit to be sure we have stated what the Word of God is, but that it's the Word of God only the Spirit can bring home to a person. And he does it and makes it, which otherwise would, ordinary, would be an ordinary declaration from human lips out of the human mind or out of the divine mind, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, it is a demonstration of far more than that. It is a demonstration of power itself. Number seven, when the evangelist crowds the Spirit and attempts to do or even share his work, the Spirit is grieved and may withdraw. You wonder what I mean by saying 
evangelist crowds the spirit. Well, you see, if I were preaching to you now as a group of people, some of whom may be unconverted, see, if I thought I had it in my... Suppose you are unconverted. Suppose some, someone out there is, is unconverted. You are unconverted. You're one of those persons who knows you have never been born again. And I'm speaking to you as such, you see. Now, this is the way I would crowd the Holy Spirit. I would try to take over His job as well as doing my job of preaching. I would think that if I could reason with you and plead with you and warn you and promise you all the verities of the Christian religion attractively enough, if I could lift Jesus Christ up in His exalted splendor well enough, I could make you see how lovely He is and how truly He'll save you. And by my very praying and wooing and persuading, I could actually bring Him, you, to Him. If I ever worked on that, I would be presuming on the Holy Spirit. I should present Christ. I should lift Him up. I could show you how lovely He is. But I know full well he alone can bring you to Jesus Christ. My stop is when I have preached. I can do no more, and I won't think or act or behave or give you the impression that I can reason you into the kingdom or threaten you into the kingdom or twist your arm unto faith or do any such thing as that. My job is finished when I've told you the old, old story. He takes over at that particular point. Now, I don't do that, but I think you know there are plenty of evangelists. Finney was a name I couldn't think of last, the other day when I was commenting on something similar to this, but Finney in the 19th century, great evangelist that he was, genuine fundamentalist, true Christian person, I believe, Nevertheless, when he endeavored to save some sinner and that sinner was not saved, you know who Charles Grandison Finney blamed it on? He blamed it on Charles Grandison Finney. He thought it was his fault that he hadn't been successful in winning somebody to Christ and by the same token, when somebody came to Christ, he had preached properly. He had exalted Christ properly. He had done his job properly. See, that's not infringing on the Spirit's domain. That is simply dismissing the Spirit of God and taking over his converting role entirely. It's our job and we are equal to the job of converting souls. I trust Finney didn't really mean that, but he was quite articulate, and he was pretty good at saying what he did mean. He was a converted lawyer, and he knew very well how to use language. He was very effective in communication, and he made ideas like that very, very plain. But when you proceed that way, the best of possible intentions, you are not committing a sin against the Holy Ghost. That would be unforgivable, but you certainly are attempting to take over his domain, to go into a territory where you don't belong. And I say this about one minister and another, but it applies to all of you because all of you are in the business of trying to win other people to Christ, and you must be doing it. You must be endeavoring to become all things to all men that by all means you win some, but you of yourself, don't ever forget it, will never win anybody. If anybody has won through your endeavors, you will praise him from whom all power comes, the divine spirit. He has been pleased to use your pittances for the conversion of human souls, the greatest honor a human being can have, but there's no room whatsoever for human boasting. Let our boasting be, in this case, 
in God the Holy Spirit. Number eight, I'll skip completely because I've developed that on another occasion, but I'm glad to have it written down here. Number nine, the Holy Spirit not only makes the elect sinner over again, but he even continues to work in him to will and to do according to his good pleasure. We've been laboring the fact that a person is born again by the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who, from above, changes the soul. When we were talking about rationality and Christian evidences and such things, and we pointed out, we give a case, a compelling case for the Christian religion. We can prove the Bible is the Word of God and Christ is the Son of God, but only the Holy Spirit can actually save them because the problem is not with their mind, but with their heart. And all we can do is address their mind when what is necessary is to change their hearts to make them willing to accept what is being presented to their mind, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit regeneration. And as we say here, Christ by His Spirit not only regenerates us, makes us over again, but by His Spirit He continues to work in us so that we work out our salvation which He has begun in regeneration. We work out our salvation. We mustn't suppose that the Holy Spirit alone regenerates us, and from that point on, we take over. He gives us a start. He gives us a foundation. He gets us in the right way. Then we walk in it. We do walk in it, to be sure, but only because He's continuing to work in us. Now, this is a monergistic, you may as well use Uh, know a few technical terms as well. This is a monergistic activity of the Holy Spirit. Uh, One work, it's done by one person only. The Holy Spirit is the one who by himself without our cooperation and during our passivity makes us over again. But this is a synergistic work here. We then, once being made alive, we work together with the Holy Spirit. But it isn't as if this is the Holy Spirit's work alone, and this is our work alone. No, this is the Holy Spirit's work alone. We are passive in that. But once we're born again, we're alive, and we respond to His continuing activity and work out our salvation even as He is working in it, in us to will and to do according to His good pleasure. I have a little more I want to say on that that I'll insert at the beginning of the next lecture, but we'll have to let the matter rest here right now.